Welcome, everyone. I like it. Drinks in the auditorium. Nice. Have a seat. Um, welcome. It's really, really a fantastic pleasure to welcome Jing Liu and Florian Idenberg this evening to present the work of their practice, So Ill. I think it's fair to say that So Ill is one of the most original voices emerging amongst the new generation of architects. There are many characteristics that set their work and approach apart from others. But one interesting and important way to enter this specificity and to understand um, and to understand it is, I believe, to take a moment to reflect on who they are and how and where they practice. First is the fact that Soil doesn't e easily fit in any predefined category. They don't exactly belong to a generation since they are actually younger than the generation they have come to be associated with. At the same time, they seem already all partaken nationally and internationally, often competing against leading architects from around the world, most recently OIMA, Ram Kulhas, and Sana, as well as Annabelle Seldor for the New Museum Expansion Competition here in New York. Second, there's the sense that So Ill doesn't easily fit in a place. The partners call themselves Brooklyn architects rather than New York architects. The practice was founded in the US, even if it is, in their own words, quote, un-American, as if choosing to start a firm here almost, as if they chose to start a firm here almost by accident. They speak of registering our contemporary and global condition not as something to be analyzed from a certain outside, but rather as a very personal experience of three partners whose backgrounds, native languages, and architectural formations could not be more different. They speak of searching for universal language at the intersection of or beyond those differences, but designed for ambiguity and an infinitude of meanings and destabilizations, at times very literal destabilizations, such as with their groundbreaking pole dance project, winner of the 2010 Young Architect Program competition at MoMA. Their work is intensely experiential, present, and material, while also being immensely reflective, ethereal, porous, and with a lightness that renders it, if not absent, then almost boundless. In many ways, So Ill's practice and work holds things together. Contradictions, hesitations, temporary and permanent, solid in the air, the seemingly simple and the infinitely complex, the atmospheric and dreamy and the intently precise and concrete, the formal and the un informal, form and performance. More importantly even, So Ill brings together ideas and buildings in a kind of choreography, at once logical and intuitive, while also always being in search of beauty as an intrinsic, fundamental, and indispensable ingredient of architecture. Much of this sense of perfectly imperfect equilibrium that So Ill's work embodies so well has been captured and rendered tangible in the practice's recent book, Ed Order, Edge, Aura. With it, as with their work, we are moved from small to large moments and experiences, textures and affects, framed details and streams of consciousness. In it, it is not only the fragments of materiality, transparency, reflectivity, solidity, or ethereality that are surprising and compelling, but also the words and stories which seem to perfectly echo the sense of So Ill's constructed parallel universe, one in which we are invited to enter and encouraged to engage. Florian Idenburg and Jing Liu co-founded So Ill in 2008. Florian holds a Master of Science in Architecture from Delft University of Technology, and Jing studied in China, Japan, the UK, and the US before con concluding with a Master's of Architecture from the Tulane School of Architecture in New Orleans. Since the firm's inception, Elias Papa Georgiou has been a key member of the team and was, a th and was made third partner in 2013. A native of Athens, he holds a Diploma of Architecture from Aristotle University in Greece and a Master's of Architecture from Harvard GSD. We're actually really thrilled to have two of the So Ill partners as part of the school, uh, with Elias currently teaching at, uh, in, the, in the Core 1 
uh, uh, first semester program of the MMARC, and Jing uh, uh, teaching uh, leading studios, advanced studios since 2009. Their most notable projects to date include the Manetti Shrem Museum of Art at the University of California in Davis, Kuki Gallery in Seoul, Korea, the Logan offices, pole dance at MoMA PS1, Blueprint at the Storefront for Art and Architecture, and Breathe, Mini Living, a housing prototype which responds to the challenges of future urban living. The practice has been recognized with numerous awards, too numerous to say here today, but for both architecture and design, and they include an AIA San Francisco Merit Award, the PA Award, the Architecture League Emerging, Emerging Voices Award, and the MoMA PS1 Young Architect Program Award, amongst others. The firm his work is included in the permanent collections of institutions such as MoMA, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Carnegie Museum of Art. Please join me in welcoming Jing and Florian, if so ill. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mao. Um, I realized that Amal and us, we have known each other for um, more than a decade. And that's probably the reason why her introduction was one of the most accurate and precise and somehow um, the, the, and the introduction really touches on a lot of the sentiment and the frameworks that we've been working in. Before I start to talk about anything, um, a little bit of a marketing um, <laughs> campaign. <laughs> the book is available on the uh, on, on sale um, in the corridor and also on Amazon, and it just came out. Uh, a few months ago, um, but we have a little bit of logistic distribution problems, so um, I think uh, get it before you cannot anymore. Um, so the book is a culmination of our work in the last eight years that we had our office. Um, and it took us two years to write every single word that's included in this book. Um, indeed, as Amal mentioned, that we're three very different um, people, including many others that work in our office. Elias um, is from Athens, um, Florian from Holland, um, Amsterdam, near Amsterdam, and I'm from Nanjing, China. Uh, once, I, I forget which movie I heard it in, but... Um, um, one of the quote in, um, that I heard that resonate very well with our working style in the office is that, you know, the highest level of intelligence is able to hold two contradictory and extremely different ideas in the same place. So this is how we work. We argue all the time and we um, contradict, uh, contradict each other all the time. And that's why this book took many, many years to conceive. Um, it would be really nice if um, you can be part of this journey as well. Um, I was, I put a, a lot of another, uh, okay, so this is, so this is, <laughs> um, I just came back from, uh, actually I'm curious because I know that we had an open house today here on how many people are still in high school and came for open, found <laughs> Oh, sorry, undergrads, <laughs> sorry, uh, undergrads. Oh, a few, okay. Um, no, I was just in London on, on Friday judging the Reba medal for this uh, part two, so postgraduate, um, I'm sorry, no, master degree um, um, uh, projects from all over the world. And I saw 300 something portfolios in a very short period of time. And I realized that um, although I've been teaching at the school and you know your generation for for a while, um, that the sentiment of the generation that um, that's sitting here um, has shifted so much um, all around the world, and it's really there is a, this of of course the pervasive post-human um, contemplation that's um, I think that's going on at this moment. And also, this uh, either it's a dystopian or completely kind of a craft-oriented um, approach like holding on to some kind of humanities that if it still exists um, today. Um, so I 
kind of reflected a little bit about based on my Friday's experience um, on this lecture's um, theme, which is to consist of two parts. I'm going to talk about the living parts and Florence is going to talk about the, the matter parts. Um, <clears throat> Since the beginning, the f this is actually um, a movie, uh, Tarkovsky's movie, that we used as the prompt of our first Columbia um, studio 10 years ago, which was exactly to contemplate um, what it would be in a post-human society or world where our environment gets vaster and vaster, but our existence as human beings gets smaller and smaller. And uh, um, on my way back f um, from London, I also watched this movie. I don't know Many of you probably have watched it. I think the movie um, Blade Runner, um, when I went to school, was very much the movie to watch back then. And I think now it's coming full circles. Um, and um, as we're thinking about contemplating about the, the technologies, the implication on our society and how we're all getting faster and racing to a faster, faster speed of connecting everything that we can consume and uh, um, things are getting more and more immaterial. The fact is that when that overlaps on the idiosyncrasy of the physical environment and the world, um, they take on edges, orders, changes, and also they become very vulnerable um, at moments. Um, and when we zoom in to this um, strange moments of the materials coming together in this uh, small scales, they can be sometimes ridiculous in a humorous way, but also in this incredibly tragic way. So. The, in the book, we contemplate on how do we then um, establish a new kind of order that maybe is different, a departure um, from the modernist way of understanding the order. Um, maybe things are a little bit more elastic and uh, um, taking risk and, um, <coughs> um, and, and the instability as a new form of uh, joy and aesthetics, new aesthetics, and also making some kind of edge that's more permeable. And maybe it's an edge where the lying on the outside of a form that you cannot draw uh, with a single stroke, or it's a aura of a person or a being that's in the city that emanates some kind of um, universal um, feelings. Um, so those are the things that we constantly talk about in the studios. And uh, it all goes back to often um, the type or the discussion of how do we want to live as human beings as long as we're still here. Um, I have been personally quite interested in, because I'm coming from a post-communist China, um, <clears throat> so the physical environment often is, uh, the, I remember growing up still quite collective and uh, quite planned and regulated. I became quite interested in the um, story of living, how it developed in the last century all around the world. Um, and I came upon this book, which I'm quite surprised that not many people know about, but it's by Melusina Faye Pierce, who was um, um, now, a lot of people call them material feminists. Um, at that moment, they were called uh, Marxist feminists. And she, came, uh, she wrote this book called Cooperative Housekeeping, which was pretty much the first um, kind of group of people that contemplated in the industrial cities how um, the technology and the new density in the cities is able to provide a new kind of way of living. And in the master plan um, sense that, um, you know, um, collective housework can be taken outside of the realm of the domestic space and um, <clears throat> And the typologies of collective um, kitchen and the daycare um, started to come into play um, as something um, um, a, 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 of a new kind of uh, urban typologies. Um, so the kitchen becomes also a shared socialized space from then um, and the daycare, as I mentioned. 
And at some point, um, as we reflect back, that why did that not happen, and why did the, uh, the kitchen becomes um, and all this new technology becomes something that we all have in our private space, is a um, is a curious moment in history. I think the uh, American culture and the communist and socialist culture diverged um, is where the consumerism as a, the driving force of um, our economics um, um, economical life uh, became the driver after the uh, recession in the 30s <coughs> And the fast forward to how that created very um, intensely individualistic and also um, um, uh, siloed, um, you know, private lives are depicted in later movies like uh, the playtime of Jack the T. And to today, um, the field of um, um, deaths becoming shallower and shallower uh, with uh, the newer uh, versions of technologies we are intensely reflected and mirrored back to onto ourself. Um, so how can we, not that, you know, I'm pro proposing that we go back to the socialist and communist, uh, you know, narrative before the diversion, but it's really interesting to reflect on that hundred years of history of living and um, and through that lens, look at uh, some of the places that we're working. And this is in North Omaha. Um, it's one of the sites that we're working currently at this moment on the collective artist uh, loft project. Um, it was a very um, <coughs> vibrant, um, predominantly black um, neighborhood. Um, in the 1960s, it was uh, um, so highly regarded as the jazz center that there was a saying that if you didn't play in North Omaha, you cannot be considered a jazz musician. And through a series of um, the investments, um, political um, and environmental uh, issues. Today, it's one of the poorest neighborhood um, in America. And uh, <clears throat> so the project that we're working on is uh, to try to use housing as a type, um, as a kind of um, urban type to regenerate the economical and uh, um, cultural life in, in the city, which we will talk about. I don't think we're going to talk about it today, but um, just to give you a context. And this is another site that we're working um, in today, which is uh, um, Leon in Mexico. In the last 20 years, um, in the um, in the kind of effort of um, home ownership and also urban development, there is this uh, very fastly made. Um, you know, cookie cutter house that's made basically blanketing the outskirt, the peripheral of the urban centers. Um, as you can see, they're built in a really um, more kind of product oriented way. There's no social, not much social space, not so much infrastructure that's put in place. Um, often it's lacking um, transportation availabilities as well. So the city realized that, that rather than this kind of um, um, the really relentless occupation of the peripheral space, um, it's better to environmentally and also community socially, it's better to redensify the city core. So we're working with um, the city to consider um, more um, mid-rise um, housing typologies that um, is based on um, co-living and, and um, collective living, which I will talk about a little bit later. And this is one of the earliest projects um, that is in Athens, Greece. Um, we didn't realize this project based because of the financial crisis um, in 2000. Eight um, and the aftermath of that, but it's also one of those um, urban, um, dilapidated urban core that's um, seeking a new model of regeneration through through the typology of the housing, which I will talk a little bit about. Um, so this is the neighborhood um, in Athens. And so there are a lot of uh, um, empty lots that's just by virtual left empty because of the lack of um, maintenance and developments and uh, the um, new in interest in um, new residents. And um, they're all left empty and you can see a lot of conditions that's half um, have taken over by nature and have um, kind of 
architecture re um, rebels. And instead of, so rather than instead of the building just as infill, passive infill typologies, um, we took um, the the same building massing and it turned it to the sideways and it used it more as um, almost a barcode to connect the empty lots throughout the entire neighborhood. So we called it the party wall as the typologies. So the buildings are super skinny. They are so skinny that you can almost not call it a building, but they just occupy half of, sometimes even less than half of the building, the site width. And by squeezing the interior space as much as possible and releasing the exterior space as much as possible. We were able to use it as more of an op urban operation to make um, this very um, dense blocks that's de deteriorating and dilapidated into something um, active again. So this was the hope of uh, the urban operation. <coughs> Um, in the end, that there will be this barcode of m multiple colors and uh, different lives that injects and uh, kind of cuts new um, energies into the city. Um, so it, it's more of a typological studies rather than uh, building studies for this project. And we continued the similar, um, this was 2007. I think it was the um, project. It's one of the first competition we entered, thanks to Elias here, um, that we were able to understand the specific conditions in the um, neighborhood. And then we took the similar idea and uh, participated in the competitions of, um, I think it's called a micro housing that Mayor Bloomberg, the last Bloomberg, uh, last mayor of New York, put out, which is to also, in a way, densify the. <coughs> the um, uh, already quite dense um, uh, New York um, um, city blocks, but th there are a lot of uh, um, unbuilt or not uh, underused uh, FAR left in some of this uh, tower in the park um, uh, modernist housing blocks. So um, we used again an architecture as an urban strategy to re-establish that uh, street edge. So we pushed the building onto the edge of the block, whereas all the other buildings are this tower in the park um, typologies that's pushed into the center of the lot. Um, and uh, try to find a way to make this unit again as small as possible um, within the code, building code regulations. So in the end, I think the building, um, the lot it was 230 square feet. <laughs> The site, yeah. no, I think the whole whole the whole unit, yeah, the whole unit was like 225 or something square foot, um, and so it's really the most essential things that's related to living that's um, um, uh, grouped in here for all the personal and the most private um, functions of the living. And then similarly, rather than kind of overloading um, the corridors, which is the common space um, in the middle, um, and doing this double loaded corridor that only gets light from one side, and inevitably you get light um, of the north um, for the half of the building, we um, made it into a double corridor and single um, unit building. So you would have um, the living space right in the middle, but the common, um, uh, common circulation are both in the front and the back. So actually maximizing the common space and uh, uh, minimizing the private space. This was um, the unit plan, quite simple. And uh, again, the top and the bottom, the front and the back, that they all become this um, common space that the private life is pushed out um, to establish this more communal and socialized space. And because of the um, this squishing of the middle, um, the building becomes almost translucent um, when you um, are looking from the building next door, that you can almost see through the building. That's That was our hope. Um, and Mimic and Eric won. I think Eric is here in the back. <laughs> 
And um, I think we had a very different approach, yeah. but I'm, uh, I'm very glad that you, you were the one doing it. Um, so this is a uh, uh, Leon um, project that started with a very dynamic um, discussion with the city stakeholders, um, the uh, uh, banks, um, the loan um, providers in the city, and they're talking mostly about how, what should we do with the city that we have as a physical space. Um, sorry. <laughs> And uh, also, how do we? How can we change the people's mentality of that we all have to own something on the land that actually doesn't have um, any social infrastructures, but somehow that land belongs to you, which is an idea that has already been planted so deeply in people's mind, and to change that. Um, preference to something that's the opposite, you know, like you don't, maybe the land is more shared and it's common and the corridor is more common, but somehow the quality of life and it's a different way of understanding life and how can we shift the value proposition for, for the people who are, um, who we're trying to um, move back to the city core. Um, and um, so c coming out of that workshop, the similar typologies that we have been always advocating um, also took a different um, kind of um, turn in this one. Similarly, rather than the double loaded corridors, we used the single loaded um, corridor building, but also changed it, I mean, twisted in an eight shape, um, uh, Milbius shape um, building form so that um, the corridor the common corridor is both outside and the inside um, in the building in different locations. And when it goes to inside, it also linked together um, abundance of uh, um, shared space inside of the building. Um, the, instead of a very regular um, um, facade, we tried to um, devise a very simple but a re repeated um, facade type, all, uh, type that is using this scallop to create an infinitely varied um, facade type um, in the building that also gives a different um, uh, width of openings that look connected to inside and outside. Um, the building is 62 um, units for $1.2 million um, construction cost. So it's a super low um, cost building. Um, um, but I think the, the uh, aim here was not so much in architecture as an object, but really as using architecture as an agency to change a certain way of uh, connecting with each other and with the city itself. <laughs> Um, so that's going to be started at, by the end of this year, right? <laughs> yeah. And this was, uh, so we, we, try, we keep trying with a new kind of way of talking about the living. And I feel that um, in the last two or three years, we finally got some, gotten some more attractions, uh, I mean, attractions um, with uh, our um, desires and aims. And uh, um, this was one of the other successful stories as well. And I think that's really because um, um, the common kind of discussion has uh, already uh, has started to change in how we um, live in the cities in, all around the world already. And this is uh, one of the uh, reinventing Paris um, is a, a new um, competition that was, was launched by uh, the current mayor um, in Paris that um, kind of encourages uh, inter disciplinary collaborations between um, different experts, also city um, officials and uh, um, sociologists and uh, basically, um, and also like users, program users to together and developers together come up with the propositions for some of the most problematic public sites in um, Paris. Um, the current edition is looking at underground sites in Paris and how can we um, come up with innovative idea to occupy them. Um, and our um, sites, um, our edition was um, along the river sign and uh, the sites that we participated in uh, was this um, <coughs> corridor from the Bastille, um, that kind of 
um, heading into the river and created this site that in a way um, could be very you know, heightened moment of these two important axes, but looking very closely to it, there's this incredible, um, the difficult to trespass um, uh, elevation change with the highway and the water being low and um, the streets, the city streets being high. So it's actually a very, very disconnected relationship between the canal and the river um, at this edge. Um, the natural instinct would be to make something big and uh, become this uh, um, uh, heightened moment at the crossing of this two, uh, two axes. Um, but counterintuitively, we decided to, um, instead of blocking and uh, creating something very um, wow um, at that moment, to create something super low and uh, make the building mass on the side of the axis. So this is a very low rise co-working space that uh, we put on our site. And the aim of that um, volume is not so much about an architectural statement, but it's really to activate that edge and populate it. Um, and the um, housing part, the very small housing part is the economical vehicle to make that to happen. And the idea is that um, this place would be changed over time through different phases. We first activated the streets with this co-working um, and also quite a public um, rooftop here. And then over time, um, when this edge, oh, maybe, oh, it's later, okay. I wanted to show this this picture. Over time, when this edge become activated and urbanistically, it um, it's, uh, transformed in the neighborhood and in the people's mind and maybe the highway can be, it, it can also play an active role in promoting the highway to be um, transformed from a vehicle, uh, vehicular space to a public space thanks to the autonom autonomous vehicles that's uh, going to happen very soon that uh, we can get the city back this piece of land because we're only going to lease it for um, 15 years and then we can give it back to the land uh, to the city and therefore the people and reconceive what this place can be so using architecture as more of a um, way of thinking the transformation of the city rather than um, a object that um, is setting the stone so I'm just gonna show you a little bit of the housing part which is also um, uh, a co-living space which shares um, <coughs> a kitchen um, in on one floor between many units and so it's intended that it's uh, um, for people who are maybe a little bit younger and they will be the primary activator of this um, part of the city. And I will end with the, the contemplation on the living uh, with these two projects that take on slightly different scales, but somehow very similar. So these are actually models of two different projects. One is a project that we collaborated with Mini Living in thinking about a future, mini, uh, future um, uh, way of living inside our city that maybe is post-object, post-architecture, and uh, um, in a you know, defining a different way of connecting with each other and with our environment. And this is a costume that we designed for um, <coughs> Chicago Biennial that just took place last um, month um, for a group of musicians. Um, and um, they would be, uh, there were four or uh, three wind instruments, musicians, and one uh, vocalist that would wear um, this specifically designed costume. And the prompt was a little bit that, you know, our environment is becoming much more related to our body scale uh, as um, the field of depth is getting shallower and shallower. And our environment is becoming more and more pre unpredictable with pollution, sea water rise. Um, sometimes we can go to very far in the middle of nowhere. So th th this costume becomes um, almost um, kind of a personal architecture that the musicians can um, take them and it becomes a filter of the environment and the self. Um, <clears throat> so the two things that did almost um, similar, um, uh, made a similar effect. 
uh, one lives in the middle of the city um, and provides a living area for three people. Um, and uh, um, in the middle of the day, it can be quite opaque, and at night, it becomes uh, completely revealing and transparent. Um, the envelope is such that it filters the, the pollution in the cities and uh, um, cleans the air by the filter filtration. And the inside, um, <coughs> there are three bedrooms that are just barely um, separated from each other visually. Um, sometimes it's with an elastic bungee net. Um, so you can see from one space to the other in this very translucent and uh, dream dreamlike state. And similarly, the musicians would play. Um, in Chicago, they played um, the music that we commissioned um, uh, composer to specifically uh, make the music for this. It's quite a somber music, and then they played this music um, in the conservatory in Chicago in one of the most um, economically um, uh, unstable areas, um, but in this very um, lush um, greenhouse environment. Um, and then they slowly walk, sometimes bump into each other, and the piece are designed based on the movement of the instruments. So um, uh, the clothes also becomes the extension of what we do. By that, I'm going to hand <laughs> and I'm going to hand the mic to Florian, uh, who's going to talk about some more concrete things. Yeah, and, and maybe Elias also wants to do a presentation in the end. We can do that. Um, and maybe, so where Jing spoke about living and how do we live uh, and what do we share, um, I'm going to show three projects that have to do with how do we make um, things, uh, focusing on, on, on matter uh, and also on labor. Um, and maybe, you know, the, the projects were the project Amal already uh, mentioned, so I'll show the Kukche project. Um, a project in Hong Kong that nobody knows about, and um, and the museum in Davis. Um, but I think it's important to look at it through the lens of how it is made, or how do we make things, uh, and 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 what is involved, um, who produces our our, our spaces. Um, Kukche, the gallery in Seoul, is a contemporary arts space in a historic environment. It's this the ubiquitous white cube. It's a cube, a white box that could be anywhere. Uh, in the world that needed to be nestled in this very um, beautiful um, historic um, setting. Not, not necessarily beautiful, but one of the few um, historic settings left in, in Seoul, uh, near the palace where um, the um, em uh, emperor was. Uh, and this was basically the, the housing of the workers uh, in the, that, that worked in the palace. They were in the surroundings, and there's a, a number of these beautiful uh, Hanok homes uh, around it. And so we took the white cube as a given, um, but we felt that this um, cube was too harsh and too um, disconnected, if you want, from, from where it needed to be. So when we went to present this scheme to our client, who is a very busy businesswoman, um, we, we decided to wrap it in a stocking that we had lying in the office um, to, in a, way, in a way, soften this edge and, in a way, maybe create a sort of a, a permanent fog, if you want, around this sort of harsh uh, uh, box. We pushed out all the um, functional things like entry, mechanical, um, and, and stairs. Um, uh, and, and this created this sort of very um, undefined uh, uh, form. Um, here you see um, its uh, context. The palace is here. These are the historic um, worker housing, uh, the Hanok uh, homes. And here in the middle is the third building. We also fixed the one and two. Um, and so we had no idea what it was, uh, this mesh. Um, but then we came across uh, um, uh, this, this armor, um, which is basically a way in which you can create very beautiful double curved surfaces that are also very strong. Um, it's uh, the, the, the maximum uh, size that is, that is uh, made um, is on the scale of the body. So this is only a very small scale. And we decided to see, can we explore this, uh, something that creates sort of this double curvature, um, yet is strong, 
uh, for the scale of the building. And so we started to experiment first uh, in the office with different scales. This on the left is the largest scale you can um, uh, buy. Uh, these are laser cut in the office. And we started to understand also how does this geometry actually works? Why is it elastic? Why does it take on these double curvatures? Because it's actually all made out of stiff uh, rings. It's just pure uh, 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 metal thread. And we found that there's one direction in which it falls stiff and in the other that it becomes pliable. And we started to map sort of the building and at the same time once we had to find sort of the, the ring, the, the size that we wanted to use, we started to work with an engineer because we knew that this thing also needed to perform uh, and hold uh, an exterior. And so once we uh, figured out the strength um, in one ring, we started to see how does that work actually on the full sort of wrapper um, of this building and these different beautiful um, uh, maps started to occur. And at some point, we had the entire building actually figured out um, in the computer. Uh, every single ring was modeled and we knew where the forces would run through the, through the mesh. And then we said, are we going to translate this into Korean and, and have somebody make it? Or should we make it ourselves? Um, and we decided to make it ourselves together with uh, Mike Ra from Front. Uh, and so what we did is we went to... Um, uh, um, we went to Alibaba.com. Um, <laughs> yeah. And very quickly, we got a lot of um, um, people that were interested um, in this one area in China, Anping uh, County. Uh, and we were bombarded with uh, specifically one uh, email um, and, and a Skype uh, a name called Ring, and she kept on Skyping with us for a while. Uh, and after a while, she sent us this. I said, that's, that looks very promising, that looks very interesting. And so we decided to travel um, first to Beijing and drive for six hours and meet this person who only for us uh, existed in the digital realm and met her in, in reality. And I don't know how many of your friends have met um, online, uh, but the first sort of physical meeting is always quite quite exciting. And so we came in on Ping, and on Ping is a is actually for us it was really incredibly fascinating to be there because it's a it's a it's a conglomeration of factories basically um, in a in sort of a grid setting, uh, mostly dirt roads. There's no civic infrastructure. There's no schools. There's no universities. There's no city hall. There's no museum. There's nothing civic. It's just factories, it's just people making things. Um, and we felt this is really the heart of sort of made in China. There was absolutely no civic life. The only place where we could stay was the brothel. Um, and we stayed there for a couple of uh, weeks. Um, but first we met uh, the brother of Ring, um, who was uh, by himself sitting in a courtyard to the size of this stage. Um, and what was he doing? He was uh, welding uh, our mesh uh, together one ring uh, at a time. Um, at that moment, we had promised our busy client in Korea that we would deliver this mesh, uh, and uh, we were fully uh, on the hook. And here Jing explains that uh, the, the, the rings, uh, the, the, the skin consists of half a million uh, rings. Um, sometimes there's a confusion in, in counting, I think in China, 10,000 and, and 100,000, something like that. So this guy is clearly uh, wondering uh, how many it really are, and Mike here, <laughs> Mike says, what are we going to do? That's Ring, by the way. So Ring, Ring says, you know what, everybody in this town can weld. Why don't we um, come up with a way in which we can all participate? And so we actually sit together, and we work there for a while, and come up with a method where multiple people can work, um, you know, concurrently at, um, uh, at this uh, mesh. And we all ended up uh, working with 60 people, um, and making 14 of these uh, swaths, uh, large stretches. Um, we used the local car wash as sort of a place to, to clean and, and uh, degrease. Um, here we do uh, a check every single weld uh, needed to be uh, inspected. The local schoolyard was a place for uh, a mock-up and a test. Um, and after we got approval, um, we were able to ship them. And we actually worked with the gallery itself um, to, to ship the, the, the goods, there was nobody in between uh, sort of as a trading company because they move things in crates around the world. Um, so they brought the, the mesh uh, to our crude concrete structure there sitting in its historic context. And we uh, worked with the ship and sail maker to hang uh, um, this, this sort of custom dress, if you want, 
uh, around uh, around that crude uh, geometry to so sort of soften uh, its edge. Um, this is a particularly uh, an, an image I like, where you see sort of this old uh, traditional craft um, meeting this new, um, say, I don't know if it's digital craft, but it's certainly something that. Uh, uh, is derived through computation, but I think these two uh, together and how they sort of uh, resonate with one another, I think is is interesting. We were able to make it seamless, so the, the 14 swaths were actually welded together in the same technique, so there's a com continuous um, uh, surface, basically, throughout the, uh, th through the building, and the building itself never actually reads as an object, much more as sort of this thing that you can walk around but never fully actually um, grasp. There's places where you can get in between, uh, up to the roof as sort of this thickened uh, poche, places where you, as you enter the building, go through this threshold and you see a little bit the uh, context uh, there. Um, and here, the relation between old uh, and new. So that's one way of making um, things. Um, and now, and maybe Jing, you have to correct me if I say things completely wrong. It's very interesting. We're, we're all presenting each other's project. So we have no, in some way, we don't <laughs> necessarily know what we are. No, so this project is a project. Uh, 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 Jing has been working on what? We work on everything together, yeah. Um, Hong Kong. Um, what is happening in Hong Kong, everybody maybe knows. West Kowloon, they're building a, um, a very a big cultural um, center. Um, with a lot of commerce, uh, a lot of uh, different, uh, um, just a new urban uh, core. P probably people uh, know about what's happening in West Kowloon. So the people in old um, sort of Kowloon, uh, they got very nervous that uh, there is a lot of development going on here where this used to be sort of the, the, the main entry into um, Hong Kong. And here we were asked by a large um, collector um, who also is very much involved in the development of the city to help um, on a lot that they were, they were developing, uh, sorry, here, um, which is one of the largest sort of mixed use uh, developments. And so uh, people probably know Hong Kong is incredibly dense and there is a multitude of programs layered uh, on top of one another. Uh, and most of these developments, they happen uh, completely around uh, malls and, and what have you. And so we, um, were asked while this building was already um, actually under construction, designed by uh, KPF, um, this is the waterfront, to take two floors of this um, project on top of the podium uh, under the residential and to turn that into a um, place in which they could show um, uh, an emerging uh, art uh, collection and also house traveling uh, shows. And so, in some way, um, I would say this is one of the most complicated contexts to work in. Uh, it's also very interesting to think of your neighbors as things that are below and above you, not just sort of left and right of you. Um, but this was, we, we, we sort of took, the, took the, the challenge and I think what we decided to do is find um, uh, uh, an approach that in some way uh, takes a distance, of course, from um, from this very dense and commercial environment, at the same time plays a little bit with this idea of um, the, the display, the showing, and, and in some way you could say the, 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 the is it lavish uh, 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 culture uh, of, of Hong Kong. Um, the envelope was incredibly tight, as it works every square inch counts uh, for real estate in Hong Kong. But what we tried to do, because this was one of the components of the project that didn't have to be commercially uh, rented out, we started to push this facade and make it as thick in a way as possible, as sort of create a buffer between this um, uh, context and the, and the art uh, itself. There is a part of a public plaza also, there's two parts of the museum, maybe it's easier to show here, um, with sort of a view corridor and plaza and landscape that we're also uh, designing. And so we decided to use glass, not um, in its ability to uh, be transparent, but actually in its ability to sort of filter out, um, to, to diffuse and to uh, reflect and to refract. Um, and so we proposed to make a skin um, of, of glass tubes that are uh, about a, a meter and a half in diameter and, and nine meters uh, uh, tall. Um, 
And in this way, there would be sort of the soft boundary between the very you know, dense uh, urban uh, um, commercial um, uh, setting and this space uh, uh, for art and for uh, contemplation and uh, reflection. And while you look at it straight, uh, it is transparent. Um, and it creates sort of this uh, uh, yeah, boundary between the, 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 the inside and the outside. And then there's areas, uh, gallery spaces, where also you can look back uh, into the, into the, uh, onto the harbor. Um, how do you make nine meters uh, tall glass? Uh, here we, again, uh, did not go to Alibaba.com. Um, <laughs> We actually went to Cricursa. Cricursa is a company in Spain that for 150 years have been bending uh, glass. They were one of the first uh, to do traditional shop uh, windows in, in Europe. Um, and it became clear that this is something that needs so much sort of uh, expert uh, knowledge that there's only very few people um, that can do this. Uh, there was a company in China that uh, tried, uh, is it North Star Glass? Uh, and um, yeah, and then Krikursa, because of its 150 year of experience, was able to take this challenge, and this was the first sort of showing of the, um, their ability uh, for the pitch to get this job to be able to make this nine meter uh, tall uh, piece of glass. That's Jing uh, there. Um, we did a mock-up. We worked with really um, a, a few of the most advanced people in uh, the glass uh, industry, um, in, in, including James O'Callaghan, uh, who did a lot of work with Apple. Um, and through that, we also ended up working with Sealy um, as an installer who uh, works on all the Apple glass. And so when, if we compare now the little courtyard where the brother of Ring uh, was welding his rings together to this uh, glass uh, facility where now the, what is it, 420 pieces of uh, glass uh, are being fabricated. Uh, and just think about labor, automation, uh, tools of production. Um, these two sheets, they first get bent uh, into this uh, curve. Uh, they need to be laminated. There's an interlayer in between, so it's double layered uh, glass. The, the two radii, they need to fit exactly um, uh, into one another. It's all um, uh, de specially developed tools specifically for um, this project. Um, large um, suction, so there's electro suction uh, cranes basically that handle uh, everything automated. Um, they, this is where they get cleaned before they get uh, the, the, the lamination goes, goes in, uh, which is the second layer. They get sort of melted. Uh, together with laser precision. Here you see the two um, coming together. Um, and then they get um, placed in a special crate. Again, inspected by Jing. <laughs> um, and then shipped, shipped to Hong Kong. Um, so they're currently, uh, they're busy um, hanging these, and you should imagine this is on the waterfront on the seventh floor uh, of this commercial uh, podium. There's uh, tornado, um, you know, winds. Uh, so an incredibly complex uh, uh, process of installation uh, that is currently going on. Uh, and here you see it uh, under construction and should be finished at the end of this year. So I will end. Um, with this project in some way maybe could speculate what can we do with these two different approaches if we try to make something um, here. Um, some of the same intelligence, and I, again, I think we, we only want to talk about sort of the, 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 the way in which uh, this um, materialized, the, these ideas became matter, so to say. Um, this is a competition at UC Davis, the University of California Davis, the Manetti Schrem Museum, and it was a design-built uh, competition. And uh, this is something that maybe as young architects you should start thinking about. It means that we were a subcontractor to the contractor. Um, the money for this project came partially from a donor and partially from the UC system. And since they could not run, run the risk of, of this project going over budget, it was capped. There was a maximum uh, budget, $25 million all in, including your fee. And it meant that what you presented there, um, you know, we as architects are very good at uh, wowing 
but in this case, we had to wow, but at the same time, we had to also uh, guarantee that we could pay for it. Um, and as an architect, you cannot take the risk. Uh, you cannot take a $25 million risk. And so uh, you have to partner with somebody who's willing and able to take that risk, which is a builder. Um, and so we partnered with a builder called Whiting Turner. They, open, uh, they operate nationally um, uh, in this country. Um, and we also partnered with uh, a firm uh, out of um, uh, San Francisco, what's a national firm, Bowling Chavinsky Jackson, uh, as the architect of record. Um, they have a lot of experience also with uh, Apple. They did all the Apple stores before Norman Foster took over. And so we were this team um, that, that had to enter this uh, competition. What was also interesting is that the competition, there was an interview process and then there was, uh, there were, um, there was a competition, but it was a long uh, uh, competition where there's quite some exchange and where they do uh, is work with sort of the, the essence uh, of this uh, site and of this uh, landscape, uh, not in a poetic and romantic uh, way. UC Davis is the, the ag school, the agricultural uh, school. Um, within the UC system. It's a very uh, empowered uh, student body. The, I don't know if people remember the pepper spray incident, but that happened at UC Davis, and in some way was where sort of um, occu the Occupy movement uh, uh, sort of uh, started. And so it's a very opinionated and very strong um, a student body who believe, because they focus on, on say, bioengineering, they, they focus on um, uh, uh, working with, um, with uh, our world and, and the ability to actually tinker with our world, they have a very strong sense of agency. And so this spirit of, of being in control or, if, or at least being able to sort of shape your own destiny was something that we in, in some way gathered from the land and wanted to bring um, into the into the into the, the the building. So we didn't want to create a very imposing building. We didn't want to create a very didactic building. But we wanted to create something very open, something that students could embrace and could um, uh, create sort of their own narratives uh, in. And at the same time, the 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 climate, the environment, which is obviously. Uh, something that we should all be concerned about, but is also specifically for this uh, student body that works so much with the land. How can you make the environment also sort of a visceral um, experience um, in the in the building? So we had sort of this idea of the productive ground, and then an additional layer that that would sort of highlight the 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 idea of the of the environment. Um, what we started to do, because also, well, there's a lot of things that go into it, and now I start to explain the whole project. In any case, um, the, the, the program was much smaller than the site. The site was 70,000 square foot, the building was only 35,000 square foot. Yet they needed a sort of a gesture. They wanted to have some sort of presence. It's at the edge of campus, and it was, how do you seduce a, a student population that normally doesn't go to a museum? How do you seduce them to come uh, and enjoy and sort of experience art for many uh, for the first time? And so this idea of openness uh, we translated in this idea of a very open structure, a structure that just creates sort of specific, specific um, spatial qualities, but not necessarily uh, 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 given by program. So this sort of tapestry, a variety of spaces, uh, light, dark, open, closed, uh, big, and small, that could take on any program, any art that still needs to be produced, also for an audience that maybe doesn't exist uh, yet. Uh, and then the program itself sort of found its way in this organization um, um, just basically uh, uh, based on the qualities of the spaces. We, we, we ended up with uh, the lobby sort of in the center, very transparent, uh, open and connecting sort of back to the, to the land, uh, an area of uh, art uh, production and education towards the front, um, uh, the offices and operation uh, here and um, uh, outside courtyard and then the gallery. Uh, spaces over there. Um, and the second layer, this layer that, that, that uh, creates this experience of the landscape was this grand uh, canopy, the canopy that covers the entirety of the site and creates spaces both inside and outside. So during the competition, when we won, um, we actually proposed to cover the entire site with the same um, single perforated uh, mesh. This was because we had to guarantee the budget. Our builder didn't uh, want to take any risk. Uh, so he said, we'll just give you 40 bucks a square foot for this single sheet of perforation, which would create a very even and very continuous shadow uh, underneath. And we were interested in making actually the shadow and the light really part of the experience itself. And so we started to, um, to most of the annoyance of our uh, boss, the builder, try to see if we could change, basically, and start working with um, that, that, that sort of uh, flat perforated sheet and, and turn it into something else. Here you see 
um, a, a shadow of a tree which has different sharpness, sort of a, a sharp edge and a more blurry edge. And we tried to see, can we create something similar um, with a material infill? So the idea of layering started to evolve and also this idea that you could, in some way, through orientation and, and spacing, play sort of with the, the, the shadows and the, and, the, and the sharpness of the shade. And we, we settled on this idea of a triangular beam that basically spans the entirety of the... Um, uh, primary structure. Um, so it's both structural and it is the perforation and it creates sort of this, this layering where the light basically bounces through these different layers of the, of the mesh and makes it much lighter. It makes a much stronger sort of presence uh, underneath. And then from the top, because this building is also visible from all around, um, it's very smooth and it sort of emphasizes this layer uh, that covers the entirety um, of, the, of the site. And what we then did is we, in order to create this variety, played with these three uh, parameters, uh, spacing, uh, orientation, and openness. And as the sun sort of moves over it, you can imagine how this creates a sort of a different uh, effect. Uh, in order to um, stick to the budget, we guaranteed uh, with our builder how much we would maximum be spending on this. And we created a parametric model uh, that allowed us to really finely sort of calibrate uh, the spacing, the orientation, and the openness, while at the same time knowing exactly how much material we used, how many connections we had, um, uh, and so forth. And so ultimately, this gave this sort of map uh, of, that, of that infill with areas, uh, for instance, used for art display um, more dense, and areas, say, that were sitting over over a mechanical uh, a part of the building, for instance, where you never could get really underneath, could be more generously uh, spaced. And that was a way to actually, through information, really also control uh, uh, the, the budget. Um, so while the steel um, was being uh, installed, um, uh, we went back um, and worked again with uh, Mike Ra from Front, who also we work with on the mesh, to start fabricating uh, these beams. Um, first, we had to determine the spacing. That became also very important because this is where the joints of the um, uh, uh, of these different uh, uh, um, uh, stretches of the of the uh, info come together. Um, 932 unique uh, uh, connections throughout the entire uh, canopy. And we went back to the motherland and um, start to produce um, them uh, um, uh, all. Well, they were, they were actually f f uh, uh, machine fabricated, but some of the components needed to be hand uh, attached. And so 932 unique uh, sections of beam packed, shipped, um, and installed uh, one by one. And what was interesting is that there was so much skepticism um, within um, the, the builder that they had uh, allowed for, I think, four months or something to install um, uh, these beams. And within two weeks, um, the entire uh, uh, canopy was installed, and only one of the 932 ones needed to be um, uh, adjusted. And so, in some way, I think for us it was real a real lesson. If you want to, if you want to, in a sort of uh, uh, an environment in which it's harder and harder to 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 actually control um, uh, uh, the execution, if you want to have some sort of say in it, it's really important that you also control uh, the information and the ability. To, to make uh, things, so the lines uh, of production, if you will. Um, here you see the building, it opened exactly, I think, a year ago. Um, November uh, last year was the opening, um, and in its relation to the, to the landscape uh, beyond the agricultural landscape here, the campus uh, over here. And so the, the canopy sort of dips down um, to the, towards the, the main access on uh, campus. As you enter the campus, this is the main road in, and this is where the pedestrians sort of come from. It sort of reaches out uh, to you. It's very low. Um, it's, a, it's nine and a half feet uh, there. And so as you cross the street, it, it reaches out. But then you come under this canopy, um, and it raises up to 32 uh, feet. Uh, and here you see suddenly all these decisions that you make in the computer being very legible uh, and very present. And really, as you sort of enter this threshold of the canopy, suddenly you immerse yourself in this very dense uh, sort of play of light uh, and, and, and shadow. Um, and something that is constantly changing right over time. The sun is incredibly present in, in Northern California. And so this really animates and actually creates sort of a completely different experience every time um, that, you, uh, that you are there. Um, the courtyard looking back through the lobby to the, to the entry. 
And here the galleries, um, not organized in a very strict sequence, but much more uh, the ability for the student to choose its own path to create its own story, and always with moments uh, opening up to the exterior, so that in some way you know uh, sort of where you are um, in, in the world. Um, that's it. Thank you. So thank you um, for a really inspiring lecture, and I wanted, to, in particular, I you know I couldn't I couldn't have thought of or you know hoped for a better lecture for open house, and it uh, the kind of work and the presentation really answered some of the questions that were coming up earlier uh, when we had the conversation with the prospective students about, you know, what are the challenges for architecture today or, uh, you know, what do architects do when, uh, you know, when they come out of here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's, it's so interesting uh, to see, um, you know, to see the kind of processes that, uh, you know, you've kind of designed and uh, engaged with and, um, the ways in which today we are, you know, really kind of both kind of constantly zooming out and zooming in, collaborating uh, and you mixing, you know, the highest, uh, you, you know, scripting and, and, and the kind of parametric design with, with craft. And you were saying, you know, it's this sort of sense of uh, immaterial and highly material at the same time, the most sort of... Uh, uh, Kind of sophisticated skin is, you know, made in China, and 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 exposing all of that uh, uh, sort of process is so kind of interesting. Um, and I also think it's it's really, uh, you know, to think about um, practice and design and collaboration and a network of knowledge. Um, I was thinking about a practice such as Front, with which you know Mike Ra and with whom you're you've collaborated, and how you know they've defined also a kind of mode of of practice. You know they are sort of facade experts, let's say, but have brought that knowledge to a completely different yeah. level now. Of, and they're all architects, and they're architects, and they're thinking about uh, really you know making and understanding how something that is sourced or made in China is going to be, you know, different than if they're, you know, working in Spain. And so it, it's just a, such an expanded uh, um, sort of context. And, and you have to, um, and, and at times it's like Google, you know, like Googling Alibaba, you know, and, and, and so the creativity extends to uh, so many different levels. Uh, you're, you're saying Googling is, is a creative act, right? Yeah. It can be <laughs> if you know what, how to yeah. search, yeah. 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 you exactly. know, and, uh, and I think to, to kind of 
learn how to search, yeah. and because this came up earlier today, is like to learn how to, you know, what is the question that you ask the search engine is more important than knowing the answer, right? Yeah. So yeah. that really, I think, came through um, in, in the talk, and I thought that was quite, quite interesting. So thank you. Um, how did you, or why did you decide to split it along the kind of Living and matter. I was. You think it's a gen It could be a gender. Uh, or a well, no, because you <laughs> said you reversed it, so yeah. <laughs> that that gets you out of the gender yes. thing. Uh. Um, well, I think let's see. As Jing said, we we have very different ways sometimes of of talking about uh, certain things. There there are um, sometimes you know these lectures of 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 uh, two people where everybody says one sentence and you know they complete one That's another. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, also, Jing and I, we saw each other f today for the first time in, what, three weeks or something, so we hadn't really fully um, uh, uh, time to coordinate. But actually, I will also say that th this lecture, we had a lecture before, which is actually called Order Edge Aura, mm -hmm. <laughs> and in some way takes us through these three realms that the book takes us through. Um, but then recently we've been talking a little bit um, you know, if you if these are the ways in which you can organize matter, because basically we talk about you know where do you put something and where do you put nothing, and you can put it in its organization, and then how do you sit, sit, situate the organization, and then what sort of presence does it create? That's the idea of that that book. Um, but we started to to think a little bit to what end, right? To what end? Uh, and I think Jing was then pushed sort of this uh, lecture into trying to figure out, you know, what are the, you know, how are we living today? And what are the, what are the sort of values set that we're actually mm -hmm. trying to, you know, put at work with this act of deciding whether is something conditions affect, you know, how we organize stuff. Um, and I think these two areas, so, you know, sharing and, and living and co-living and like, how do we socially uh, uh, um, um, relate? Uh, and this idea of, of labor in a in a certain way, so not necessarily so, but the making, but also the you know the ability to make, and how do you make in different places, and what does that actually mean? Who are the people that are making it? So maybe a little bit more of a social mm -hmm. angle, so mm -hmm. to say. I think maybe Jin can say something about that too. But I mean, that's mm -hmm. that's sort of what, how we started to transform a little bit the the, the conversation. Also, because I think we got a little bit worried um, that architecture can end up only being um, a, a sort of a luxury, like we don't mm -hmm. want it to be a luxury project. As you know, Jing is a communist, uh, Elias. You're in, a socialist. It, yeah, and Elias is born at the birthplace of democracy. And so, you know, sometimes we wonder, uh, you know, what do we do here uh, or how can we be ourselves within a, a certain um, reality, mm -hmm. yeah. I also think that you know we started office in our office in 2008. It was a very unsettling time, and then um, the more we grow our practice, the more we're confronted with the, you know, what actually happened after 2008. You know, in Omaha, for example, in um, made in China city. You know, like in the factories that's producing these things, and so I mean, as you know politics are getting more and more erratic and uh, um, you know technology becoming more and more unsettling for a lot of people politically but also culturally I we, we had the intuition that it's important to, to go back to the fundamental questions of you know just live and matter you know if we're talking about the meaning of living you know how do we interact with each other what is the, that fundamental relationship um, sure we can all have if we move outside of city we can all have big pot of land and you know buy a kitchen you know IKEA kitchen like that's not even the question at this moment so how do we want to live together as human beings is one of the fundamental questions as I think in time like this it's really important to go back to and also this uh, kind of re-establishing a meaning with matters um, you know stuff we we can produce a lot of stuff as you can see anything in these days um, we don't even need people to produce very sophisticated things anymore um, but at the end of the day you know that things have meaning you know um, and how do we re-establish that relationship by the story of who's making it what's the tradition how did the technology evolve from the craft to the digital crafts 
Um, and through that um, narrative, maybe we can regain this connection with the things we touch, with the things we decided to put here. So they're not just this, you know, bought, sold, transactionary things. No, and I mean, I think that really comes through uh, in the work. And I was thinking about, uh, you know, your first, uh, well, it probably wasn't the first, but the PS1 MoMA project is so, um, you know, there's so much continuity uh, in terms of setting the stage, right? So you're using uh, architecture as a kind of creating a series of situations, of social interactions, of... Uh, and and uh, and this the sense of engagement uh, with the structure and and kind of um, participation in a way continues throughout the work and uh, and I think with the subsequent project that you showed today there's always this um, architecture is kind of mobilizing a set of relationships and collaborations and and a network of people and you know especially for the gallery um, it's you know the sense that the entire town you know becomes part of that you know the kind of making of that um, of that project and so that's a kind of expanded story uh, of the of the project uh, uh, in itself, um, so I think that you know that's quite quite clear in terms of um, architecture's agency to kind of mobilize and um, and it's also interesting. Uh, I think you know we have been. Um, I guess it's uh, Alejandro Zerapolo that declared that you know the envelope was the last space of uh, of architectural kind of intervention in terms of, but I think he defined it at almost, as almost uh, um, the sort of, okay, this is the kind of beauty stuff that you add on top, right? Like everything else is done and the architect comes and, you know, does the, does the kind of face of it all or the brand of it all. But I think you're, you're re-thickening that and, and kind of, uh, um, in, in terms of all of the making that that goes in it, it and bringing back the kind of social dimension, which I think is is really um, uh, quite interesting. So as it as it disappears and it gets blurred, it actually is getting thicker in terms of um, not only the effects but the stories that are around its making. Yeah, and in some way we also wanted to create it a space of in between, so that it's not just public and private, but there is sort of this space mm -hmm. that nobody owns. Uh, uh, later, but you were part of the kind of practice, you know, very early on, and I know you, you've been really working in um, the competition in Paris, and, uh, um, uh, and this kind of sense of the, of the boundary in places like Athens is also really uh, interesting, right? The kind of balcony and the thickened, the sort of negotiation between inside and outside, which co comes through actually uh, in a way in the early projects of uh, housing, right? You were already playing with this kind of inside and outside, even though it wasn't so immaterial. It was already um, quite present as an idea. And I was thinking about Athens and uh, that negotiation. And um, do you, is that? Yeah, um, yeah. I think I don't know if people know the, the sort of prevalent typology in Athens, the uh, well-known um, polykatechia, where um, it's also because of the climate that everyone has, has sort of um, an external um, space, their own space, a balcony. Um, I think uh, there, what is interesting is um, that, that that sort of typology was generated through um, almost like sort of a development a process, sort of sort of legal kind of framework, uh, sort of individual development of um, units, and so and although I think that 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 exterior space appears to to sort of create. Um, a relationship with the city, I think, often is not uh, utilized. Mm -hmm. They're like actually very uh, narrow. It's a section of of uh, the streets that are also kind of like awkward. So um, at the end, uh, um, these spaces are there, but they're not sort of used as they were um, supposed to. And I think some of the of the projects now with this sort of thickened in a way mm -hmm. edge. Um, uh, try to sort of um, rethink that kind of in-between space between the interior and, and the mm -hmm. exterior. Um, 
more directly even in, in the project in Athens where with the sort of flipping of the of the typology of or the of the prevailing way of building on the lot um, where that balcony becomes um, the facade the circulation uh, um, but also it sort of opens to that collective um, uh, courtyard um, in in the Parisian uh, in the in the Paris uh, project um, there is a, a little bit different. There's not necessarily a, a balcony, or there's very small um, kind of balconies. But there, um, I think the the thickening also relates a little bit with the uh, with the with the city um, and even with the sort of history of the city. I think what is interesting in that project is um, the uh, speaking also about the the layering and the and the narratives is um, an effort to try to um, kind of like bridge or connect many different histories, but also futures of the city. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, um, the, the project sort of ties into the historical Osmanian uh, city. And uh, at the same time, with what Jing was saying, with sort of flexible uh, proposal, uh, kind of like foresees maybe uh, uh, or waits sort of like changes that will come to the city and sort mm -hmm. of trying again to connect uh, the two. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, I, uh, I was thinking also in the lecture um, about what you spoke and what you didn't speak about. Um, um, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of rethinking around the question of typology and materiality and experience, but we don't talk anymore about the diagram um, so much. Uh, and, and yet, I think it's, you know, you still, you know, we see some traces. We see traces <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, of kind of diagrammatic thinking, even though it's not necessarily programmatic. I mean, even though it is experiential or it is, um, but it's, it's still it, the field. The field, yeah, yeah. And I was, you know, because um, it's true. We are in this moment where it's, you know, that conversation has disappeared, and yet. And yet, I think it's still there somehow. And I wanted to see, you know, how it evolved uh, for you uh, in your work. Or I think it's fair to say that, in our case, still the diagram is a tool, at least in design, to mm -hmm. to design basically. Um, not indeed necessarily programmatic. If we um, start to think about maybe a generation before us that used program you know, and the juxtaposition as programs mm -hmm. maybe to create maybe newness. I think we don't, and maybe this is the digital, has in some way eradicated maybe function, right? Because now everything can happen anywhere and anyway, everybody's on their phone. So it really doesn't matter what the function of a room is anymore because the activity yeah. is actually taking place elsewhere. And so there, the, the, we do very much believe though that you need to find a way to generate variety, difference, different types of experiences. So is there a sort of systematic way or maybe even a diagrammatic way to create variety, mm -hmm. so to say, and, and, and various experiences. So I think it's fair no, to say that for us, when we, we design very much still through a diagram, not necessarily through, say, um, vignette or through scenery or through mood in, in that sense. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. So yeah. the kind of the diagram, well, the diagram has moods, but not, yeah. but you're not sequencing a kind of, it's not a kind of phenomenological like narrative or. Yeah. Um, it's not prescriptive mm -hmm. you know, yeah. well it's, I think some I think many times um, we start we start like a, a desire I think of a really strong uh, diagram and then there's a phase where we're trying really hard to erase mm -hmm. <laughs> I think the beyond, diagram beyond it. Mm -hmm. um, the maybe the last uh, question before I open it up is you know one of our uh, kind of core semesters here is the housing and I do see that um, there is a kind of renewed interest generationally in the question of housing and, and um, social housing in particular, uh, with with some success. I mean, everybody thought it was dead, and and yet today, you know, I think between you know Tatiana Bilbao in Mexico or um, uh, Michael Molson in Los Angeles, or you know, you 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 guys are working on housing. Hillary is working on housing. Uh, with her practice moss and uh, it, it you know it's it's like it's kind of like housing was dead and housing is back and you know these notions of uh, 
uh, sameness and difference and field and you know all these questions are coming together along with the sort of social um, dimension is that is that fair to say that it's something because I remember a few years ago you said you know this is where we want to take mm. the practice and and um, so are you finding that uh, this is happening or is it just uh, a kind of few moments um, that are not adding up, or, or could it add up? We might all have a um, different response to this question, but I, I think the one thing for me that is what is happening, and I think where we enjoy in some way being part of is if there is some sort of transition happening or some sort of new form is emerging, and if we can participate in that conversation. <coughs> I think the, the, the idea of micro, mm -hmm. Uh, and probably you have had larger conversations around that topic already here, but I think it's one where we should also be very much thinking about, you know, what does that, and I think that's what Jing was trying to talk about in the beginning of the, of the project. Um, say the micro units we did here, the ones that uh, um, an architects ended up constructing, was a very controversial uh, mm -hmm. conversation, right? It's like how right. much square foot can we squeeze out of somebody's, you know, living space right. in order for it to be, you know, still market, you know, part of, of, a, of a marketable um, uh, proposition. I think what we're, what we're realizing is that this is, uh, in some way, I think there is a need for higher densities. There is a need for less people, right, on, or more people on right. less, uh, in less area. But how do you establish them within these very small units, new type of relation, or shared commons, so to say. But I, I, I think it's fair to say that I think this transformation is taking place. It's not necessarily driven by architects. It's no. maybe driven by you know, uh, developers and, 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 and tech companies like we live or what have you. And I think uh, we should also be careful that we don't get too... You, you know, Linak, I think we need to be very conscious of, of what sort of role we play uh, within that and what sort of uh, um, ways we have to also uh, push back a little bit right. towards that. Right, that makes sense. But at least design is brought into yes. that. Yes. <laughs> you, know, um, I, I, you know, moving beyond the notion that housing is just a number of units yeah. um, to achieve, that you, you can actually contribute design thinking to living again, I think is a... We did deliberately not try to do it in the U.S. initially. Uh -huh. right. You know what I mean? So we went to Mexico and we went to France, where there is very strong tradition exactly. still of yeah. kind of social housing. So I think that's another conversation to have, of right. course. Right. Well, I also think that we are particularly quite concerned with not concerned, but I think we need to kind of collectively as a society discuss this idea of the. You know, assistant, right? Like the internet, AI, Google Assistant, you know, Siri, they're all coming home and they're becoming smart home. And so the home is packaged into this new uh, wave of hyper product, right? To, yeah, that's that. sold to us. And I feel like if we don't, I mean, we talk about housing as an urban thing and as a social um, topic as well. So if we don't talk about it as a society enough, you know, as a foundation, to just bring up that the the um, frequency of the discussion on how do we want to live, uh, we're going to be kind of you know too late in that discussion. You know, the the, the package will be done and uh, you know handed to us before we can even contemplate and talk about what yes. that space is before you know it gets. Uh, yeah. Pushed on us. Yeah. The house as just something that gathers your information continuously. Right. Yeah. I don't know if the <laughs> younger generation students feel the same way. <laughs> Maybe we're just yeah, old. We should, we should ask them. Uh, we should open it up. Yeah. <laughs> um, one, one question that's particularly interesting to me is that you bring a certain intensity to your focus on craft in each of your projects. Um, if you come to a point where you don't have a solution, you continue to solve for a solution that works to complete your design. Um, so my question starts at the beginning. How do you begin and nurture your design process through the entire project to come to a solution that meets uh, both your initial and final goals? I think um, 
an earlier version of this lecture was called To Be Determined. And it basically, and you already spoke a little bit about the sort of embrace of processes um, as part of the project itself. And that's why we'd like to show also these transformations in a way, if you want, from you know, an initial impulse and then the effects of collaboration and new insight that then ultimately creates sort of an outcome. So um, I, I think as a, as a, we don't know where we are going basically, right? So in the beginning we have a certain idea or maybe a certain intuition um, and then we just go down the path and, and the path itself also determines the ultimate uh, uh, form. Um, I do think we have some sense and maybe that's based on experience or, um, you know, actually sometimes I, I explain it's very simple. There's only, you know, if you're a cook and you're cooking, there's so many different ingredients, but as an architect, there's very few <laughs> ingredients to pick from, right? It's like steel, concrete, glass, wood, but there's not, it's not like this wide array of, of, of things. And so very quickly, you can already say, okay, this is going to the metal realm or to the concrete realm or to the glass or to a combination of these or wood, you know, but I think it's not, it's not, you know, I mean, like it's, there is, I think our strength actually lies more in taking something that is quite, is, straightforward element and, and, and just working with that single material. So it's not so much very sophisticated materials or very complex things. It's really just, I think, I think we have some sort of general material understanding. And since we are really interested in this process of translation from an idea into the making, I think, yeah, we spend a lot of time also just you know, exploring how to make things. So it's a little bit of experience and intuition, I think, by, by now as well. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. In follow up to that, how do you interact with your contractors in such a way that it seems to me that you're reclaiming a lot of the construction process, which is something we talk a lot about in architecture? Yeah. Can you speak more to your relationship with the contractor in production of your structures? I, I think it's important um, to be super respectful to um, m most contractors love what they do, um, which is maybe different from what people think um, or at least they you, you know they they have a knowledge you know in a material that you won't have and so I think first being respectful and understanding what their knowledge is and having and using that impact and just but also showing that you know you know stuff that you're not just somebody who, who just sits and you know, has no, no control um, I think the idea of being able to to control the information so where we spoke about with with Dave is really at that moment the contractor didn't know what we were doing anymore but and we just had to prove through the tools that we were in control. Um, but, I th but I think the way we are set up, uh, I think both contractors and architects are set up in some sort of adversary uh, relationship. It's also how, the, how contracts are written. So I think you have a certain awareness of that, but I think very early on starting to work together is important. Um, but recently we, we also have started to build like our own mock-ups, for instance, and really, you know, actually get our hands a little bit more dirty to just show people how, you know, we would like certain things to be done. So I think, yeah, you, you just need to go a little mm -hmm. bit beyond the drawing and beyond the computer. <laughs> and, yeah. Yeah. I think over there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, in your projects, I was really in impressed by the ambiguity of uh, inside and outside and the thickness of in-between spaces and the discussion of territory um, in those Porsche spaces in your projects, especially the Korean Museum. And I find it really interesting that the facade or the edge is often used as a breakthrough point in your design and all the materiality buries inside. And my question would be, uh, why did you put an emphasis on the edge or the envelope? Uh, what does the envelope mean to you? Elias. <laughs> <laughs> you answered the first edge question. So uh? You answered the first edge question, so you have to. Um, well, we have a book outside. Yeah. <laughs> 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 That explains very well. Um, no, I think, I think um, in a way, um, and indeed, I think we spoke a lot about also um, organization and how we're inter interested in sort of organizing different um, relationships into the space. 
but the, the edge, in a way, is ultimately what defines the relationship of, um, of the space we are creating, right, the architectural space, um, with the exterior, with the city, with the landscape, uh, with the context, with, with um, in the history. Um, so um, I think in that, in that sense, um, I think this, this idea of also um, depth um, relates and with the, with the third chapter, with this aura, um, is how um, these kind of like objects are perceived. And I think um, we um, are, are interested in creating uh, not only organizations, but also, uh, let's say, um, objects or forms or, or spaces um, that allow for this uh, kind of um, openness, uh, allow for uh, to be interpreted, to be read, to be experienced in, in multiple um, different ways. I think maybe relates back with this uh, conversation with the diagram. Uh, it's where I think also the diagram um, starts becoming more um, ambiguous and less of a the sort of one-liner. Uh, first of all, I just want to say that your work is amazing. Um, and my question is, as a really young firm, do you have any advice on people that might be looking to open up their own firm in the near future after grad school? I would never go to grad school. <laughs> Sorry, Ed. We had a... I, so we we, uh, we, had, we had an event we had an event with the artist uh, Ai Weiwei a month ago, and uh, I think the conversation was about um, an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes, and he literally spent the first half hour going, "Why are you in school? Like, like I was in school for six weeks and I was done." So thank you for continuing. <laughs> um, I think let's see. We all have different stories. Um, for me, it was very good to work somewhere else uh, and really learn. Um, and I worked in a practice where there was an emphasis on making things, and that's where I learned how to make things. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I would work somewhere first. I think it's. I think there there are people that start straight out of school, and it's it's the, the first maybe. Well, this is something actually we can maybe talk about a little bit in a broader context about sort of young, and promising, and then uh, what happens next. Because I think in the beginning when people come out of school, there's an incredible uh, skill set that you have. You're sort of the most advanced, so to say, because mm -hmm. you're really you know in the moment, so to say. You understand what is trending, if you want, and so. And you're quite uh, agile, and you're able to produce very quickly things that maybe you know resonate with our time. Um, but they're all um, you know in uh, they're they're mediated, right? It's it's imagery, it's digital, but it is not uh, a physical thing. And so um, you can maybe be promising very quickly or sort of stand out, you know, within that field in the beginning. But the the challenge is not so much the production of of say that. Um, uh, those those projects that maybe resonate with our with our contemporary time, but the ability then to you know to to transform those things. I mean, we're we're interested in making physical space. We believe architecture is a physical activity, um, and it is something you know it's a, it's a tactile it's something that you need to experience. So how to translate th those images, those ideas, um, is something that's very hard to learn by yourself. Um, and so maybe you can say, well, I really know what's going on, and I'm, you know, you can be sort of visually, you can produce really interesting things, and maybe you stand out. But then the the the, the challenge, mm -hmm. I think, what we also see happening with, you know, you can say the same of our contemporaries, or maybe a generation that, you know, say be in between us and and you guys, that they they are very strong. But then the next step, the follow through, that's something you can't really learn by yourself. So that's where I think just working somewhere and seeing who's, how somebody else has dealt with it and, and does it is, is, is very useful. I mean, I think we all worked in different places and, and it, it, it helps. Thank you. Um, to go back to the first like response to the first question about not knowing where you're going um, is that the sort of uh, thinking you take when you start your practice? Um, 
I guess like all, all of these projects like little insights into a larger goal or is just the act of like trying different things? Because we see like a vast array of work, type of work and the way I'm working. Um, so I was just wondering if you could speak to that, like what sort of the sequence of projects mean for you guys like in the long run? I think Jiggins, your turn. <laughs> Well, I think first of all, um, not knowing where you go, you're going can be super productive as well. I mean, we started on that basis. You know, our like as Florian said, our first lecture title was um, to be determined, and uh, um, you know, the idea was that we had no idea where the architecture was going. And when we started in 2008, you know, I think one third of architects lost jobs, and most of the office folded. And uh, you know, when we were in your your kind of age, then we were thinking, well, what do we do as a generation? There was no, there's no way forward. There was no one telling us, you know, this is the issue that we have to tackle and this is the problem that we have to solve. So we just turned that as a productive question in itself. So in a way that I would say that it's you know, projects. It can be a way to guide you through this project from one place to the other. Um, just by doing things, I think it was very productive to us. Um, the first project we did um, with PS1, we had only $70,000 budget, which is super small for something that needs to stand for entire summer. So, and we had this very ambitious um, goal to make something elastic. Uh, which can only be made by hand. So we basically did it ourselves, and I think that gave us the confidence to, to do Kuche, which you know, at that same moment we said, well, we built something like that, so we could just work with people and build <coughs> something, uh, you know, that's never been thought before. So one thing led to the other in a way. So, um, and but we always had this idea that not knowing what's going to happen and not knowing what's the question we need to solve can also be productive just by doing it. And I think maybe we all in some way grew up in very different contexts than where we are now. And we moved quite a bit around the world. And often we, situ you know, we find ourselves in situations where we have no idea what to do, like from, from very uh, early on. Um, and I think the, you will be surprised how creative you become yourself if you don't know what to do. You know what I mean? Like human beings are super inventive. And so I don't think you have to be afraid to go to a place where you have absolutely no idea what to do. I think you'll be surprised how inventive and how creative you actually are and what are the things that you come up, can come up with. So rather than trying to develop something that you're always certain about, like what if you go always to a place where you have no idea what to do? Um, then, you know, you'll see suddenly sort of new ideas emerging rather than sort of repeating things that, you know, already seem to give you the confidence that they, you know what they are. So I think especially at, you know, at your age, you should go to the things that make you the least comfortable, um, where you have absolutely no way to figure out what to do, because you'll see that suddenly new ways start to emerge. This is turning to more like a... Yeah, um, help session. <laughs> like yeah. a self-help <laughs> self <laughs> session. Actually, the reason we teach is to learn things from you guys. Yeah. You know, we, we are constantly <laughs> wondering. <laughs> also, uh, you know, what, what's the new set of problems we need to solve, right? And uh, so, and I mean, being, being with the, the, in the school, I would say you learn from each other, you learn from your teacher, but we also learn from you and the discussing and the searching for things together. So if you're taking my studio next semester, <laughs> we're going to be doing that. <laughs> you only have to buy the book first. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Thaddeus. Um, Jing, I was pretty intrigued when you were talking about the, how, the housing um, projects you guys are doing in Leon, Mexico. And from the way you described it, it seemed that it was as much an ideological and political sort of game that you're playing and not just a political one. And as to note of you insisting that we should have more conversations about housing, uh, my mind just went to sort of not just the places where there have been strong architectural traditions of living in social housing, but places like Singapore, Japan, and certain parts of Russia where new types of housing are basically invented. And to do that, architects worked with a whole host of other experts, you know, sociologists, anthropologists, psychoanalysts, 
So my question to you is, in your mind, in this day and age, who are the experts? Who's your dream team you'd like to see sit on the same table and talk about this? Um, well, with the Mexico project, we talked with actually the users, right? So, because the biggest question there is how to reverse the thinking of the typologies of housing that you're supposed to get when you don't have so much. I mean, the people who live in this uh, uh, housing, they buy them, but they uh, their income needs to be under a certain level to be able to qualify for that, um, you know, the loan. Um, basically, it's a form of social housing. Um, so when you don't have so much, I mean, they, they have no disposable income to be, you know, to speak of. Um, to decide where you live is a huge decision in your life. And then, you know, there is a narrative for the, is the biggest key of question in, in this project. So we actively just, you know, we had workshops with the city together, we hosted a workshop, talked with the people, made many, many models to just interact with people to kind of tell them, I mean, show them that there could be another value in a different kind of typological way of thinking. And in the Paris project, um, I think the developer was very important, uh, instrumental in also talking with the city about the financial models that we would only lease half of the site and give back to the city so that you know the the site is given back um, in into the, the economic, economical life in the in the city so in every situation is slightly different I would say the key um, person we have to convince um, but um, I mean that's why I went back to 140 years ago when housing was a very um, important discussion in the society, it was not only architects working on it, it was people who you know, um, designed the parks, the people who were working with um, you know, feminist issues and health issues, everyone was talking about it. So in a way that if we were going to make a housing and a living at the center of our discussion as the kind of core of our discussion so that there is a common understanding of where we want to be, um, we have to talk with all walks of life in all kinds of uh, typological projects. And uh, I think that's what we're trying to do also in different parts of the cities. Economical realities is different in different parts of the cities, different parts of the world. Um, but I think indeed just through doing them and talking about them and involving as many people as possible around this discussion is what we're trying to do. Maybe one last question. Hi there, thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I noticed that the majority of your projects or are completed in um, white or they're predominantly white. I was curious if you view white as sort of a neutral non-statement or if it's more of an active element that you purposely engage each time or, or sort of what the role of, of that element is in all of these various projects. Should I say something? I don't think the exteriors are white, right? Most of our buildings. <laughs> Except at the translucent ones. Um, we, we like green also. Yeah, yeah. we like, we, do, the, we, no. <laughs> we have done pink buildings. Um, I think colors. No, but I, 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 we can have a, a, a long conversation about it. No, first of all, I think color is very difficult. Um, but also color is often applied. So color is then paint or something and it becomes like a graphic thing. But so it doesn't have sort of a real meaning in itself ap apart from being a signifier or like giving something. But it's often paint, right? If, 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 um, if, yeah, in some way it sounds maybe like a cliche to talk about honest, honest materials, but you know, um, uh, and white paint is also white paint, meaning the structure in California was painted white. But at the moment you start painting it another color, right, it becomes suddenly a whole, it opens up a whole larger conversation, which is one where I don't think we necessarily have enough vocabulary yet to sort of speak to. Um, but I, I uh, will um, admit that I spent eight years uh, working for Mrs. White, uh, Sana, and the white question also there came up uh, uh, many times. Um, but in some way, I think the ability to reduce certain pieces of say uh, information or things that you actually experience uh, allow um, to highlight others, right? So at the moment, 
that you start to uh, um, use color in a certain way, it starts to really diminish certain other readings and certain other experiences. So I think um, at this moment, mostly um, we are trying to um, yeah, develop more spatial and tactile experiences that are not necessarily over, over um, um, ex sort of overwhelmed by, by color. I think color can be very, very strong. So, yeah. But the white is also, um, I mean, it works towards the kind of ethereal, immaterial, slight abstraction. Uh, I think that the, you know, it, it works towards that. Yeah. It, more, more, for me, oops, more oops, than oops, the kind pick? of, uh, more than the kind of honesty, it's, it's more kind of the ethereality Erasure. of yeah. it, right? Well, I think because, because many, at least at the projects we saw um, today, um, had indeed to do these qualities because there were there are a lot of qualities about light mm -hmm. and shadow and and translucency and then you right. know white or gray is kind of like more neutral in order to yeah. kind of elevate and amplify these kind of mm -hmm. qualities. But we have made a pink building <laughs> and a green installation. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I also think it's maybe still a terrain that we further need to explore, meaning I think it's, uh, it's, I'll take it as a challenge. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much. Welcome, everyone. I like it, drinks in the auditorium, nice. <laughs> Have a seat. Um, welcome, it's really, really a fantastic pleasure to welcome Jing Liu and Florian Idenberg this evening to present the work of their practice, So Ill. I think it's fair to say that So Ill is one of